So hello and a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today on the session uh, of Fish Welfare and Aquaculture. I'm Neha Chaturvedi from PRAPO, Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations, India's apex animal welfare organization with 174 members and 200 supporter organizations nationally. Our speaker today is Dr. Ankur Jamwal, who is an assistant professor of ecophysiology and aquaculture at Rajin, Dr. Rajendra Prasad Central Agriculture University, Pusa, Bihar. A little brief about him. He was born among the foothills of Himalayas in Kullu and was always fascinated by nature, which is why he gravitated towards studying the effects of anthropogenic stress on wildlife. Um, Dr. Ankur is investigating stress and fish behavior in aquaculture systems in his uh, current position. Apart from his academic life, Ankur likes to photograph people, especially his daughter. Our session today is going to focus on welfare practices of fish in aquaculture, physiological and psychological stress in fishes um, due to aquaculture and understanding fishes as sentient beings. Uh, note to all the participants, your mic, and videos have been disabled for the session, but we will have a question answer session after the presentation. So please keep your questions coming in the chat box. Uh, over to you now, Dr. Ankur. Uh, thank you, Neha. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes. Yeah. One of the most commonly said phrase in the last two years. <laughs> for sure. So, yeah. So uh, let me share my screen first. I hope uh, you, can, you all can see the first slide. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Neha, for uh, for this introduction, and I'm really happy to be here uh, for this uh, for this very you know unique topic, fish welfare and aquaculture. We rarely get to talk about this in India, and um, I've been you know teaching for the last few years, and uh, I've been a student of fishery sciences since 2005. And uh, to be honest, we don't really really teach our students or we don't really learn about the fish i mean as sentient organisms or you know all we look at fish is just like a, another commodity right like uh, we look at crops but um, uh, as a student of fishery sciences we tend to develop a kind of relationship with the fish where we get to know the animal better and um, the same thing has happened with me um, uh, over the last uh, since 2005, I've got to know more about fish and, you know, I have uh, uh, tend to appreciate fish as not just a mere commodity, as, you know, as an organism that has, that feels, uh, feels pain or, you know, um, is in discomfort and can, you know, let you know that, you know, something is not right. So uh, this, this presentation is all about that. So in the contents, I will be talking about aquaculture, the current scope of aquaculture in the beginning, and then um, we'll talk about fish welfare. The reason why I'm talking about aquaculture is that I've seen a list of participants, and I, I guess some of them are not uh, from the aquaculture background. So I'll just let them know why uh, we are studying aquaculture and why is this, the whole uh, industry so important. And then, We'll briefly talk about uh, fish welfare, the concept, and then uh, I'll move towards fish welfare in aquaculture. And finally, I'll talk about some more research areas, some of the ideas that you know I have uh, in my mind uh, related to this um, topic. So first, starting with uh, aquaculture, you know, humans have always been uh, eating fish since, since you know, since ages. Uh, the only thing is that the early humans were first actually not doing aquaculture. They were hunting fish. They were they used primitive tools like spears or you know stun fish with rocks or stones and you know uh, take the fish out of the water bodies for the consumption. Uh, and this was a time when we were still a part of um, the food chain, and everything was fine, you know, because. Uh, we were either hunting or getting hunted, you know, and as long as we were part of the food chain, the whole ecosystem ecology was balanced, we would just go out and hunt the 
amount of food we needed and just leave the rest and spend the rest of the time you know, hiding away from the predators. But then our ancestors invented agriculture and we got this sense of food security. Uh, we started to settle at one place and uh, from that evolved our civilizations. Similar to agriculture, the early roots of aquaculture can also be traced to these small pools and puddles uh, along the banks of the rivers where our ancestors, you know, they thought that, you know, every time they're hungry, they don't, they don't have to go out and hunt fish because hunting fish is not that easy. Uh, killing fish in the water, if you have ever tried, I mean, it, it's really, it's really tough. It's, it's not that easy. First of all, I mean, these days, you don't find as many fish in the rivers as you would few years, I mean, 20, 25 years back. But still, even if you spot a fish in, in the river or in a lake, it's not that easy to catch it. So the early ancestors, they, they thought, you know, why not just herd them or shepherd them into small pools and puddles where you can just, you know, keep them as stocks. And whenever you are hungry, you would just go there and take one out and eat it. So that would save a lot of uh, time and energy hunting the hunting animal in the wild. So that is how aquaculture probably originated. And today we have really advanced systems of aquaculture, uh, ranging from uh, these common pond-like structures, which uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of and have seen. Then uh, these large cages that are, in, that are installed in um, uh, large natural water bodies. So these cages are nothing but, you know, uh, netted structures that you submerge in the water and then you put the fish inside it and let the fish grow. You feed the fish, you take care of it. And at the end of a particular period, when you think that the fish is ready for harvest, you just take, it, take them out and sell. And then you also have some other indoor uh, techniques of aquaculture, for example, recirculatory aquaculture system where you know, you recirculate the water, you use, reuse the water again and again. Uh, you can integrate aquaculture with agriculture, which is aquaponics. So, you know, fish, uh, all the fish excreta needs to be filtered. So instead of using mechanical filters, you can um, use that water to grow uh, plants because plants need nitrogen and fish provides that nitrogen in its feces and its, uh, um, um, it doesn't urinate, it, it excretes ammonia through its skill, right? So all that nitrogen can be used by the plants and um, the water from there can be reconditioned because the plants can take up all the, all the nitrogen, uh, reduce the amount of nitrogenous waste in the water and that water can be uh, recycled back into the system. Um, or, you know, you can also have this kind of aquaculture for that is for recreational purpose where you have uh, small ponds in your garden where you keep fish, most commonly koi carps and uh, goldfish, or maybe even your aquarium. But what really is aquaculture, FEO defines aquaculture as farming of aquatic organisms, including fish, mollusks, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. For people who do not know mollusks, these are those uh, bivalve shelled organisms that you that I'm sure you must have seen then crustaceans like shrimps and then aquatic plants um, for example sea algae or uh, spirulina a farming specifically or aquaculture specifically applies to rearing process where you have an intervention some kind of intervention to enhance the production that could be either through uh, regular stocking that means you bring in fish seed from somewhere and stock it in your ponds or in your tanks and then you feed it or maybe provide fertilization and then um, also protect your fish from predators and from disease. This is in contrast to capture fisheries. The reason why I'm telling you what is aquaculture and capture is because I'm going to use this terminology uh, very soon uh, in the next upcoming slides. So capture is uh, basically exploitation of aquatic organisms without stocking the seeds. In simpler terms, you have a large uh, natural water body. There is um, a breeding population of organism inside it, say fish in our case. You take out 
uh, a proportion of fish for your consumption, leave the rest over there. The fish that you have left, that is now left in the water body will breed and uh, will uh, replenish the stock. So basically the recruitment or replenishment of the species or of the fish in the water body happens naturally, automatically. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, this is the basic what is capture fisheries. Now, um, coming back to consumption of fish. You see, if you look at this graph, which I've taken from uh, FAO's report, Food and Agricultural Organization's report, you can see that the demand for fish is rising. If you see this yellow line, it's the growth rate of population, world population. And if you see this red line over there, it is per capita consumption of fish. And if you compare these two lines, you'll see that the rate of increase of um, per capita consumption exceeds the rate of increase of population. Also, this blue shaded area dot, blue shaded area is the amount of fish that is consumed for food now. Just look at the rate at which it is increasing. It's, it's, it's phenomenal, right? So what it tells is that we are demanding more and more fish for consumption. In 1961, um, the global per capita consumption was just 5.2 kilograms of fish, as opposed to 19.4 kilograms, which is almost four times, four times more uh, in 2017. So now that means we are demanding more and more fish. But unfortunately, the capture fish is stagnant. This, is, this means that feed, the fish that we're getting from natural resources, from rivers, from oceans, from our lakes, it's stagnant. In fact, a lot of stocks are declining. And the reason for this is our greed. You know, we have taken so much of fish from these natural resources that we have not left behind the number of fish that you would need to replenish the stock. If you remember when I was talking about the captured fisheries, it's important that you only take out a certain proportion of the fish for your consumption and you have to leave behind the rest so that it can breed and replenish the stock. But we have taken way more than that. And as a result, our global captured fisheries have stagnated. There's no more fish over there that we can exploit. We have reached a level, you know, and if we put some more pressure uh, to that stocks, we might see that a lot of fish species will, would go extinct and we don't want that, which is why we have aquaculture. Aquaculture since 1986 has been providing us with the fish. You know, if you can see this graph, you'll see that since 1986, the, the fish from aquaculture has exceeded the amount of fish that we catch from the natural resources. And this gap between capture and aquaculture is, you know, widening and will continue to widen, which is good in a way, if you ask me. The reason is that we need to reduce the stress on our wild resources. And the only way we can do is that we source the fish that we need for our consumption or for non-food purposes from aquaculture. Now, what are the non-food purposes? Non-food purposes are that the fish, we use a lot of fish to feed our animals. The fish is converted into something which is called fish meal. It's dried, it is um, uh, powdered and included in uh, cat, cat food, dog food, and also fish food. So that those are some of the non-food resources. So this can happen if we reduce the pressure on capture fishes and source um, our needs, our demand for fish from aquaculture. Uh, but aquaculture has also created some problems, you know, um, growing aquaculture doesn't necessarily mean that we are reducing uh, pressure on capture, but that's a discussion for some other time. Um, but right now, what we have to understand is that aquaculture is growing. And when aquaculture is growing, and we have fish in our ponds, we need to think about its welfare. We need to think if the fish that we have in the ponds is taken care of. It's just like you have a dog or a cat at your home. Um, 
you, you treat it with respect, you love it, you know, you, you pamper it, you pet it. And the, and the more you give it, the more, you, the more the animal gives you back. So this is the kind of relationship we should have with fish. You know, of course, we're going to eventually kill the fish and consume it, but the time period before you kill the fish, the fish should live its life in you know, what, what should be the right word. It should be happy for that point of time, you know, until it's killed. So when we talk about fish welfare, the question is, what is fish welfare? Talking about this concept of welfare in general term, you know, when you talk about fish welfare for animals, it is a concept which says that, you know, a, a welfare is something that ensures quality of life as experienced by an animal. That means if an animal feels happy doing something, you let that animal do that. Or, you know, you don't put an animal into stress because that way um, the fish would be unhappy. But then the question is, how do you measure quality of life? There needs to be some uh, objective scale to do that. How do you measure quality of life? And another problem is that we look at the comfort of fish from the human perspective. I'll give you an example. You drink, when you, the water that you drink is clear, it, it's clean, right? And a lot of people think that fish should also live in clean and clear water. But that's not always true because fish needs food and food comes from where? In the, nat in the natural water body, it comes, it comes from water. And what is that food? That food is in the form of phytoplankton or zooplankton, which makes the water look dirty. Now, dirty doesn't mean you have pollutants in it or contaminants in it but it still doesn't look fit for human consumption, but it's good for fish. So we have to stop looking at the comfort of fish from our perspective. We need to understand what is good for the fish. And while doing research for this, um, for this talk, I was uh, you know, looking for a definition on fish welfare and there were so many definitions. And this is the one that really resonated with me. And I, later I found that a lot of people actually use this definition. It is by proper Professor uh, Donald Brug, who said that the welfare of an individual is its state as regards its attempt to cope up with environment. That means if an animal feels stress, it should be in a condition to evade it, or we should provide an intervention that alleviates the stress or removes that stress. But coping means having control of mental and body stability. Uh, and that welfare is poor when coping ability is low. Now imagine a pond where you have fish, right? And the water temperature is gradually increasing at, and it increases beyond, beyond the comfort level of the fish. Now, because the fish is in the pond, it doesn't have the ability to escape. It cannot go anywhere. So its coping ability is low. At that point of time, we would say that welfare is poor. Had that fish been in the river, it could have easily evaded that stress and gone to some other stretch of the river where the temperature is low or you know, it felt more comfortable. But you take away that, take away that capability of the fish to evade stress in a pond. And that point of time, the onus lies on the owner of the pond to provide good, uh, good and uh, welfare to the fish. But then again, stress and fear are part of coping strategy. Comfort doesn't always mean welfare. Just imagining a person sitting on a couch and just having potatoes, potato chips, just because you know he feels like doing it and he's comfortable just sitting on a couch the entire day and eating chips. That's not good. That's not welfare. A human needs to exercise and exercise is what it's stress you know but eventually it lead it will lead to coping strategy so there are so there's no really you know exact definition of fish welfare and there's another um, debate on how do we define fish welfare based on do it whether do it on biological functions such as growth or uh, weight gain or versus feelings but how do we know what a fish feels we don't really know 
especially in a pond where the water is murkier and we cannot see the fish or its movement, we do not know what a fish feels. And as far as biological functions are concerned, you know, they may not always reflect, they may not be always, you know, they may not always reflect the welfare of the fish. For example, you know, uh, I like to give example of terrestrial animals because a lot of people have uh, had chance to interact with them. You have a cat at your home and you keep on feeding the cat and it's gaining weight, which is a biological function. And you would see that, oh, my cat is gaining weight. It's, it's getting fatter and fatter. That means fish is in a state of welfare, but that's, that's not right, right? I mean, a fat fish, a fat cat doesn't always mean that it is fit. It needs, it, it needs to be lean. It, they, they need, it's, uh, we need to balance its uh, basal metabolic rate and BMI and you know, weight as uh, in accordance with its, uh, uh, with its age. Same goes for fish. A really fatty fish doesn't mean that it's in the state of welfare. So this, these are some of the some of the things that you know we always debate about. And when talking about fish welfare, these are some of the points you know that always crop up. Do fish feel pain? Is fish comfortable inside? Or do fish have fish have consciousness? The sentient is fish sentient? Does it does it have memory? Can fish have emotions? Or can fish feel psychological pain. And if you really ask me, you know, uh, we have worked on the memory part uh, in my lab before, and we have shown that fish does have memory. Uh, for example, in this photograph, which is from um, a student that is currently working in the lab from where I did my PhD, this fish was uh, trained, uh, or you can see the heat map actually, but they, uh, the, there was a fish which was trained to take the right hand side of the tunnel to reach this chamber. And after several days of training, when wow. we allowed this fish to you know, freely move in this, uh, in this maze, you know, it had equal chance of going into the left hand side or into the right hand side of the maze, the fish chose to go to this chamber through the right hand side because that is how it was trained. So, you know, you can actually train the fish to do something and fish has memory. Uh, and this memory can be affected by poor water quality or contaminants, which again, you know, has implications on fish welfare and ecological implications. Uh, fish often uses memory to find its um, breeding grounds or feeding grounds or to evade predators. But if you interfere with its memory or with its, uh, with the mental process, it's eventually going to affect its breeding capability, its, its feeding abilities, and, you know, its overall uh, life um, welfare, or what should I say, the comfort in the life. So fish does have memory. So that is one thing that I'm really sure of, and we have shown it experimentally. Then, there's this agonizing debate on fish. You know, people always keep talking about, you know, does fish feed, feel pain? There are certain biologists who say that, you know, uh, fish is unlikely to experience pain. But then there are some other laboratories who have shown that, you know, fish do feel pain and, those, and that pain can be reduced through use of morphine as an analgesic, which is exactly what happens with people like, you know, with humans. The same laboratory has also demonstrated that trout actually has pain receptors on them. So even then, you know, even despite all these convincing evidences, we are still debating whether fish has pain or not. And for me, it's just uh, semantics, tomatoes, tomatoes kind of a debate whether fish has pain or not, or doesn't have pain. The problem here is that we're trying to visualize pain in the fish in a way we feel the pain. For example, if I prick my finger with a pin, I would feel something. And that something is called pain. You know, we, we call term this thing, this feeling as pain. But 
when, and we have also seen that when we prick uh, a fish with a needle, it also shows discomfort. But should we term it as term it pain or not? It's just a semantics, you know. Okay, didn't want to call it pain, don't call it. But it's fish does show that fish lets you know with the flick of the, you know, it tries to evade that place, you know, it tries to jump out of your hand if you're trying to, you know, hold it in your hand and trying to prick it with the needle. So it shows you that, you know, it's feeling something. And the feeling is not comfortable for the fish. Now, whether you call it pain or you call it something else, it's just up to you. But the problem is that this pursuit of hard biological evidence where, you know, everybody's hell-bent to find the evidence for pain in fish, it's just dragging the entire issue of animal welfare. I think we should just, you know, get over with it and focus on animal welfare. Yes, aquaculture is important, but we should create treat the animals with respect. And if you need certain indicators of um, welfare, you have behavioral indicators. You know, fish is perfectly capable of showing you whether it's in comfort or is in discomfort. It, it knows how to evade the stress. So we can start using behavioral indicators more and more. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, really lecture this and get into this whether fish is sentient because Piapo already has a very good uh, talk on um, this entire issue, which was given by Jonathan Balcom. And, uh, and you can go to Piapo's YouTube channel and uh, see that and, and see this talk. And it's, it's really interesting and very informative. I would now move on to fish welfare in aquaculture. But before I do that, I would like you all to answer one question. Uh, please answer this question in your chat box. So what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word fish? Please use about 20 seconds of yours and please only give one answer. I'll wait for about 20 seconds. Okay, I've, I've started to get response and I think there is um, a request to use Hindi also. So I will also try to um, explain things in Hindi henceforward. Uh, okay, so some of the answers are aquatic animal, fascinating, swim, water. Dr. Dinesh says water, okay. Uh, Srijan Nijar says water. Kuchlok bol rahe machli ko dekkar unke dimag mein pehla shabd kya aata hai? Ye question tha. Kuch log kehte hain pani, kuch log kehte hain swimming, kuch log kehte hain fascinating, aquatic animal. Um, money, exactly, you know. For a person like me, if you ask me, agar aap mujh se poochhenge, ki what, what comes to your mind when you hear the word fish, sabse pehle aapke di maag mein kya aata hai? 2005 se, since 2005, I'm involved, you know, in learning about aquaculture and teaching aquaculture. Main mat se palan padha raho, aur mat se palan padha raho 2005 se. So, mere liye, pehli baar jo, अब मैं इस पोजीशन में हूं कि जब कोई वर्ड कहता है फिश तो मेरे दिमाग में सबसे पहले आता है मनी पैसा क्योंकि एक्वाकल्चर हम किस लिए कर रहे हैं ये कोई चैरिटी नहीं है दिस इज नॉट अ चैरिटी इट्स इट्स अ मनी मनी अर्निंग वेंचर बेसिकली यू नीड यू डूइंग इट टू अर्न मनी पर Abhi mein ek aur answer dunga. You know, main aap sab se kaha ki I've asked, I've asked all you people to give only one answer, but um, I get to cheat because you know it's my talk, so I'll give you another answer. Whenever I am looking at a pond, kabi mein kisi pond ko dekhta hoon, kisi lake ko dekhta hoon, kisi river ko dekhta hoon, to automatically mere dimag mein ek hai aata hai ki isme kaun si machli hogi, aur kya wo machli khush hai? Is that fish happy in this river, uh, in this water body? That is a thought that immediately comes into my mind whenever I see a water body. And it's it's natural because, you know, I've been dealing with, you know, I'm, I'm studying stress since a very long time. I'm much like stress pay research for a lot of years. So it's obvious that my mind will come to me like I see a water body, or I see a pond, a river, a river. So my mind comes to me like what is the stress in that moment? Is the fish experiencing stress or is it happy? These are some of the things that come to my mind. But then the question is, why fish welfare? 
बट बिफोर दैट यू नो एंड द क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो कम्स की जब आप फिश वेलफेयर की बात करते हो तो फार्मर्स को कैसे समझा हो कि वॉट इज फिश वेलफेयर वो आपसे पूछेंगे कि वॉट इज फिश वेलफेयर और हम क्यों करें फिश वेलफेयर यू नो देर सम वेरी ऑब्वियस रीजन आप क्यों करेंगे बिकॉज हेल्दी फिश फिश इज हेल्दी यू गेट हेल्दी मीट फॉर ह्यूमन कंजम्पन अगर आपकी फिश स्वस्थ है तो वो खाने के लिए भी अच्छी होगी और स्वस्थ मछली का मार्केट में बेटर प्राइस आपको मिलता है अगर मछली में इंजरी होगी उसमें कट लगा हुआ है या मछली देखने में अच्छी नहीं है तो उसको आपको उतना पैसा नहीं मिलेगा उसकी प्रेफरेंस इतनी ज्यादा नहीं होगी एक और प्रॉब्लम हमारे इंडिया में है बिग प्रॉब्लम दैट इज इन इंडिया इज दैट वेन एवर समथिंग है फिश इज एन इज अ लाइव ऑर्गेनिज्म इट इज बाउंड टू हैव समाइंड ऑफ डिजीज उसमें डिजीज होगी और जैसे ही कोई डिजीज होती है तो लोग आ जाते हैं कि भाई ये यूज करो ये नमक फेंको ये फेंको वो फेंको and you know right now there are so many products in the market which people are just you know mindlessly dumping into the ponds or actually aquaculture is a leading reason for antimicrobial resistance globally kyunki humne itne har kisam ke antibiotics try kar diye hain apne usme aur ab antimicrobial resistance pada ho gayi ab halat ye aa gaye hain ki hum log एंटीबायोटिक एंटीबायोटिक लेते हैं और वो असर नहीं करते हैं तो अब हमको नए और नए एंटीबायोटिक खोजने पड़ रहे हैं और मे बी कुछ सालों में ऐसा हुआ कि अब हमारे पास एंटीबायोटिक्स खोजना आसान नहीं है शायद हो सकता है एंटीबायोटिक काम करना बंद कर जाए विच इज गोइंट बी वेरी वेरी अलार्मिंग सिचुएशन अनदर रीजन इज आपको पानी में पानी की इर्द गिर्द या जैसे होता है हम देखते हैं कि गाँव के तालाब में इन द विलेज पॉन्ट्स यू नो दॉ ऑफ डिंग ऑफ वेस्ट दैट है गाँव के तालाब के आस पास बहुत गंदगी होती है कपड़े दो होते हैं गाँव घर का कचरा बस पॉलिथीन में बंद किया पानी में फेंक दिया तो वो सब कचरा जो है वाटर बॉडी उससे धीरे धीरे पानी जो है गंदा होता है उसमें विशाले पदार्थ निकलते हैं क्योंकि फिश जो है अपने अंदर इकट्ठा कर लेती है मछली को तो कुछ नहीं होता लेकिन जब हम उस मछली को खाते हैं तो सेम टॉक्सिक कंपाउंड हमारे अंदर चले जाते हैं विच इज बैड फॉर आर हेल्थ इसके अलावा देर आर इकोलॉजिकल बेनिफिट मछली पर्यावरण के लिए अच्छी है वो पानी को साफ करती है एंड देन यू नो इफ वी कंटिन्यू विद दिस फिश वेलफेयर थिंग वी विल इवेंचुअली हेल्प इन डेवलपिंग एथिकल सोसाइटी यू मे हैव डाउट ऑन वेदर फिश हैव कॉन्शियसनेस नॉट कॉन्शियसनेस और नॉट बट यू मज डू वी डू हैव कॉन्शियसनेस सो वाई डोंट वी यूज आर कॉन्शियसनेस and treat animals with respect then again the question is how do you assess fish happiness aap usko measure kaise karenge ki wo khush hai ki nahi hai because you know machli thodi na bata rahi hai ki main khush hu nahi hu aap machli ko dekh ke nahi bol sakte hain ki shakal ko dekh ke andaaza nahi laga sakte hain you cannot look at the face of the fish and say whether the fish is happy or not this fish on your screen right now could be happy or could be not i don't know maybe it's just trying to tell me that i'm not happy this was a picture i took um, of a fish in an aquarium maybe it's telling me that it's not happy but the aquarium looked pretty well maintained it was a large aquarium uh, maybe this fish was happy i don't know so there is no objective scale to assess happiness and wealth of the fish but there are certain indicators that we that we can use for example stein in um, in his book chapter on assessing fish welfare in aquaculture uh, talks about welfare state of the fish you know aapke machli jo talab mein hai uski welfare state ke bare mein baat karta hai uski welfare ke bare mein baat karta hai a fish welfare is an end result of these two things positive feelings negative feelings if there are more positive feelings it will lead to welfare and positive feelings or negative feelings are a result of the welfare needs for example whether fish has adequate net nutrition if it has adequate nutrition positive feelings if good quality positive good health positive feelings if it has behavioral freedom behavioral freedom kya hota hai behavioral freedom hota hai ki machli jo hai aap usko ek jagah pe bandh ke nahi rakh sakte machli ko ghumna firna hai bahut sari machli aisi hai jo ki showing behavior dikhati hai there are lot of fish that show showing behavior for example you know um tetras you know they like to remain in in shoals and they like to move around in shoal that is their social behavior jaise hum logo ko ghumna firna pasand hai ek ek chhund mein rehna pasand hai doston ke sath rehna pasand hai 
और इंसानों के साथ रहना पसंद है वैसे मछली को भी पसंद है और वो तभी हो पाएगा जब हम एक प्रॉपर स्टॉकिंग डेंसिटी देते हैं और क्राउडिंग नहीं करते हैं तालाब तालाब में इतनी सारी मछली नहीं डाल देते कि उसको घूमने फिरने में दिक्कत हो तो उसको बिहेवियरल फ्रीडम मिलना चाहिए कुछ मछली होती है उसको राउंड सर्कुलर टैंक ज्यादा पसंद है तो उनको आपको सर्कुलर टैंक प्रोवाइड करना है देन यू हैव सेफ्टी फ्रॉम क्रेडिटर्स पर ये सब आप कैसे एसेस करेंगे बिहेवियरल फ्रीडम का इंडिकेटर क्या है सेफ्टी का क्या इंडिकेटर है These are some of the indicators that we can use actually to assess the welfare state, food quality. आप चेक कर सकते हैं food quality, nutrition, protein उसमें proper है कि नहीं है. Feeding system क्या उसको आप timely feed कर रहे हैं जब उसको भूख लग रही है क्या उसको feed कर रहे हैं पानी का temperature आप बिल्कुल measure कर सकते हैं. Nitrate, nitrite, carbon dioxide, pathogens ये सब measure कर सकते हैं. तो जितने भी indicators हैं ये आप actually fish का aggression वो आप देख सकते हैं. उसकी abnormal behavior वो आप देख सकते हैं. उसकी हैंडलिंग आपके हाथ में आप उसको कंट्रोल कर सकते हैं तो दीज आर सम ऑफ द इंडिकेटर सम ऑफ द एग्जांपल्स दैट यू कैन कंट्रोल एंड इफ यू मैनेज टू यू नो ऑप्टिमाइज दीज थिंग्स इट विल इवेंचुअली लीड टू वेलफेयर स्टेट एज सिंपल एज दैट व्हिच इज व्हाई ट्रेनिंग इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर यू नो बिफोर यू स्टार्ट एनी एक्वाकल्चर अंडरस्टैंड द द बिहेवियर ऑफ द फिश दैट यू आर डूइंग और ये स्पीशीज स्पीशीज वेरी करेगा श्रिम्प का बिहेवियर अलग है कतला का बिहेवियर अलग है मृगाल का बिहेवियर अलग है आपके कैटफिश है उसका बिहेवियर अलग है तो सबका बिहेवियर अलग है वो आपको समझना पड़ेगा पहचानना पड़ेगा उसके हिसाब से आप ये सब पैरामीटर्स कंट्रोल करेंगे नाउ क्विकली विल गो थ्रू सम गाइडलाइंस कुछ गाइडलाइंस टू ओवरऑल गाइडलाइंस इन पे जाएंगे uh, वर्ल्ड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन फॉर एनिमल हेल्थ की गाइडलाइन हम फटाफट देखते हैं इट हैज एन एक्वेटिक एनिमल हेल्थ कोड विच टॉक्स अबाउट वेल्थ फॉर फार्म फिश इट हैज फोर चैप्टर फर्स्ट चैप्टर डील्स विद रिकमेंडेशन फॉर द वेलफेयर ऑफ फार्म फिश की जब मछली तालाब में है तो उसकी वेलफेयर के लिए आप क्या क्या कर सकते हैं uh, और ये कैटेगरी मैंशन करता है ये ये, ये जो गाइडलाइन से बताते हैं कि अगर आप फिश वेलफेयर मेंटेन करोगे अगर आपके फिश में वेल फिश वेलफेयर रख रहे हो तो आपकी फिश खुश होगी आपकी ग्रोथ बेटर होगी उससे आपको अच्छे इकोनॉमिक बेनिफिट मिलेंगे सो फिश वेलफेयर ऑल्सो लीड्स टू इकोनॉमिक बेनिफिट एंड एट द सेम टाइम्स क्योंकि आप उस समय फिश के मालिक हो कि आपकी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी है कि फिश जो है उस पॉन्ड में स्ट्रेस फ्री रहे आपकी हैंडलिंग प्रैक्टिस ऐसी होनी चाहिए कि फिश को स्ट्रेस ना हो और फिश को स्लॉटर कैसे करना है फिश को स्लॉटर करने से पहले उसको स्टन करना है ताकि उसको पेन साइंस ऑफ करेक्ट स्टनिंग उसको करेक्टली कैसे फिश को स्टन करना चाहिए उसके मेथड्स उसमें लिखे गए हैं अगर ये गाइडलाइंस फ्रीली अवेलेबल है इंटरनेट से अगर आप जाएं आप सर्च करें आपको मिल जाएंगे और ये कह रहा है एस्फिक्सिएशन या कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड या अमोनिया बाद फीलिंग विद आई सी यूज नहीं करना एस्फिक्सिएशन क्या होता है जो हम इंडिया में करते हैं नेट से मछली को निकालते हैं और उसको बाहर रख देते हैं और वो पानी के भाव से वो मर जाती है दैट इज एसफिक्सिएशन ट्रांसपोर्ट एक मछली को एक जगह से दूसरी जगह ले जाने की भी पूरी गाइडलाइंस है कि उसको प्रॉपर क्राउडिंग नहीं होनी चाहिए उसकी जो आदमी उसको ले जा रहा है उसको ट्रेनिंग हुई होनी चाहिए उसकी ट्रांसपोर्टेशन शुड बी गुड ऑल दो थिंग्स देर देन देर इज यूके इज एनिमल वेलफेयर कम्युनिटी विच टॉक्स अबाउट फाइव फ्रीडम्स फ्रीडम फ्रॉम हंगर एंड थर्स्ट and this is generalized it's not specific to fish it's for all the uh, all the animals and it's also applicable to fish feed freedom from hunger and thirst freedom from discomfort freedom from pain injury and disease freedom to express normal behavior and freedom from fear and distress <laughs> these were the first five freedoms that you know uh, animal welfare committee jo isko pehle fish animal welfare committee bula karte the unki taraf se ye five uh, fundamental you know वो फाइव फ्रीडम्स दिए गए एक गाइडलाइंस दी गई लेटर ऑन दे रियलाइज दैट यू नो वेलफेयर इज आल्सो लिंक्ड विद फीलिंग एंड द गुड एनवायरनमेंट दैट वुड लीड टू बेटर लाइफ एक्सपीरियंसेस ऑफ एन एनिमल व्हिच इज व्हाई नाउ फाइव फ्रीडम्स इज कॉल्ड फाइव फ्रीडम्स एंड अ लाइफ वर्थ लिविंग तो एफएडब्ल्यू सी ने 2014 में 2014 इट हैड इशूड सम गाइडलाइंस वन वाज ऑन गाइडलाइन ऑन वेलफेयर ऑफ फार्म फिश एंड अनदर गाइडलाइन वाज ऑन स्लॉटर so guidelines is only for atlantic salmon and rainbow trout uh, 
कब से गाइडलाइंस चालू होते हैं कब से गाइडलाइंस देना शुरू करना है इट शुड बी राइट आफ्टर द एम्ब्रियोस हैच जब फिश अंडे में है क्या उस समय उसको वेलफेयर देना चाहिए या फिर अंडे से जब अंडा से बाहर मछली निकल रही है तब से उसका वेलफेयर शुरू होना चाहिए या फिर उसने बाहर का खाना खाना शुरू कर दिया तब से उसका वेलफेयर शुरू होना चाहिए आइडियली इट शुड बी गिवन राइट आफ्टर हैच जैसे वो हैच करते हैं तब से शुरू होना चाहिए लेकिन प्रैक्टिकल रीजन की वजह से फर्स्ट फीडिंग स्टेज जब उसने अपना योग सैक एब्जॉर्ब कर दिया है और अब वो फीडिंग शुरू कर दी है तब से वेलफेयर शुड बिगिन इट एक्सप्रेस कंसर्न एनवायरमेंट फैक्टर्स जेनेटिक्स न्यूट्रिशन मूवमेंट हैंडलिंग डिजीज एंड पैराफेक्ट प्रिवेंशन एंड ऑल्सो प्रोटेक्शन फ्रॉम प्रेडिटर्स दिस इज अ बिट कॉन्ट्रोवर्शियल इशू predators because you know predators are also animals you, you should not harm them to protect your fish so you need to have certain um, certain techniques to keep your predators away from your from a system aapke cages aise hone chahiye ki cages mein uh, invasion na ho predators aapke cage ke andar na aa jaye upar se bird jo hai wo aapke machli ko uda ke na le jaye isliye uski uh, aapko is dhang se uski covering deni hai ki machli को फिश बर्ड ना ले जाए प्लस कुछ लोग क्या करते हैं नेट लगा देते हैं इसके ऊपर आपके पॉन्ड्स के ऊपर और कई बार बर्ड्स आके नेट में फंस जाते हैं और वो मर जाते हैं वो भी ठीक बात नहीं है तो यू नो दीज थिंग्स शुड बी कंसीडर्ड आपकी मछली जो है एस्केप नहीं होनी चाहिए जो आप फार्म मछली है वो वाइल्ड में नहीं जानी चाहिए क्योंकि उस सबके वाइल्ड मछली पर खतरा है वो उसकी पॉपुलेशन कम हो सकती है एंड there is this uh, fwc also says you know we can make certain compromises for the benefit of environment for example there are certain animal ethical organizations which say that triploidy that is monosex fish nahi hone chahiye because it takes away the right to breed or uh, uh, but that is not always you know practical uh, for example tilapia india mein tilapia is an alien species which is a prolific breeder agar wo hamare environment mein escape ho jati hai jaisa ki hua hai it can completely replace the tooth and local fauna so in that case triploidy and monosex is allowed uh, is allowed monosex tilapia in india is uh, legalized so agar wo escape bhi kar jati hai to breed nahi kar payegi wo wo uh, local species ko uh, take over nahi karegi and then fwc uh, says that automation feed jo hai automatic feeder hona chahiye and then it says that scientific procedure jo you know jo hum jaise logon pe lagu hota hai ki humko fish ko kaise treat karna hai wo zyada uh, stringent hai jo scientist pe jo laws hain wo zyada strict hai in comparison to farmers farmers ke liye kuch relaxation hai wo sab bare mein bhi fwc bolta hai and finally fwc accepts that you know welfare is a challenging issue and uh, you need to have some compromises uh, किलिंग कैसे करना चाहिए मछली को मारते समय क्या क्या कर, क्या कर सकते हैं बेसिक फंडामेंटल यही है कि जब मछली को आप स्लॉटर कर रहे हैं जब उसको हार्वेस्ट कर रहे हैं तो उसको पेन नहीं होनी चाहिए उसके लिए आपको उसको स्तन करना है और उसको हार्वेस्ट करने से कुछ दिन पहले आपको उसको धीरे धीरे भूखा रखना है धीरे धीरे उसकी फीडिंग कम करनी ताकि उसका मोटे मेटाबॉलिक रेट कम हो जाए उसकी ऑक्सीजन डिमांड कम हो जाए और उसके बाद फिर आप उस उसकी वजह से उसका स्ट्रेस जो फाइनली आपका स्ट्रेस होगा वो भी कम होगा क्राउडिंग अवॉइड करना है नेट क्योंकि जब हम हार्वेस्ट करते हैं तो यू नो एक वी यूज नेट एंड वी यूज वी एक्यूमुलेट द फिश एट वन पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम एट एट वन प्लेस तो वहां क्राउडिंग होती है वी हैव टू अवॉइड इट एट द मोस्ट यू कैन डू इट फॉर टू आवर्स नॉट मोर देन दैट इफ इफ यू हैव टू एक्यूमुलेट फिश फॉर मोर देन टू आवर्स यू हैव टू स्टन इट एंड किल इट मछली को बाहर कई बार निकालना पड़ जाता है एक जगह से दूसरी जगह ले जाने के लिए You cannot do it for more than 15 seconds. Preferably use fish pumps, which is pumped with water. Pumped with water, you can pump it from one place to another place. And you have to reduce discomfort during transport. And uh, you also have to monitor water quality. And you know, fish should be stunned. Automatic devices 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 should be stunned. Automatic तो वो इसको स्तन नहीं कर पाएगा तो मे बी जो बाल की मछली हो प्रॉपरली स्तन नहीं हो रही है एंड इट्स इन द पेन सो इट्स ऑलवेज गुड टू हैव ऑटोमेटेड डिवाइसेस दैट कैन कंटिन्यू टू वर्क विदाउट फिटी फॉर लॉन्ग एंड नो स्किपेशन नो यूज ऑफ कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड एंड नो यूज ऑफ रैपिड चेलिंग स्टनिंग पैरामीटर्स आर ऑल्सो गिवन एन एफ एडब्ल्यू सी की स्टनिंग किसको बोलते हैं और स्टनिंग कैसे करनी चाहिए 
नॉर्वेजियन एनिमल वेलफेयर एक्ट फाइनली हम इसके बाद सीधा इंडिया पे आएंगे नॉर्वेजियन एनिमल वेलफेयर एक्ट इज समथिंग दैट आई रियली लाइक बिकॉज इट इट प्रोटेक्ट ऑल वर्टिबेट्स इंक्लूडिंग फिश टेकअपोर्ड्स हनी हनी बीज एंड सेफलोर्ड्स इट से एनिमल्स हैव एन इंट्रेंस इन वैल्यू दिस इज माई फेवरेट फेवरेट यू नो पार्ट ऑफ दिस एक्ट इट सेज एनिमल्स हैव एन इंट्रेंस इन वैल्यू ओवर एंड अब दर यूटिलिटी वैल्यू सो एनिमल्स आर नॉट जस्ट मनी उनकी एक अपनी भी लाइफ है उसकी वैल्यू हमको करनी चाहिए और उसके लिए हम सबकी ड्यूटी बनती है कि हम एनिमल सफरिंग को रोकें हम हेल्पलेस uh, एनिमल्स को ऐसे अबैंडन नहीं करें उसको गलत चीजों के लिए इस्तेमाल ना करें और लाइफ बेट या लाइफ जैसे कि लाइफ बेट या लाइफ फीड के लिए उसको यूज ना करें फाइनली कमिंग ओवर टू इंडिया वट आर द रूल्स एंड गाइडलाइन एंड लेजिस्लेशन इन इंडिया इन इंडिया वी हैव सम एक्ट्स विच आर कंसर्न विद फिश एंड फिशरीज फॉर एग्जाम्पल इंडियन फिशरीज एक्ट एटीन नाइनटी सेवन बट इट डज नॉट डील विद फार्म फिश इट ओनली डील्स विद द फिश दैट इज प्रेजेंट इन द कॉमन प्रॉपर्टी फॉर एग्जाम्पल रिवर्स एंड ओशन then you have uh, indian marine fisheries bill which was recently introduced again does not deal with the uh, palm fish only deals with wild marine fish resources and life cycle of fish aap kitni machli pakad sakte hain kaise pakad sakte hain the only thing that comes very close to farming of fish and you know uh, giving some guidelines are coastal aquaculture authority of india which but again it deals only with shrimp and its guidelines you know the gist of the guidelines says that you know it it gives an indication that it it has nothing to do with animal welfare it all has to do with producing shrimp that is acceptable in the international market so the international market says that you should not use this antibiotic caa coastal aquaculture authority will say aap usko use nahi karo but fish welfare as such kuch nahi hai agar coastal aquaculture authority bol raha density kam karni hai that is because you can control the disease because of from it but still it has a it has a connotation of welfare to it same is with national fisheries development board which is related to aquaculture practices in india it also prescribes certain guidelines for stocking for nutrition for health monitoring cleaning of cages which are not uh, specifically for fish welfare but you know have a connotation of fish welfare but there is nothing concrete about fish welfare in summary i've gone through a lot of um, documents that uh, pertain to you know fish welfare in india or guidelines to uh, aquaculture in india but there is no legal protection to fish as such however some organizations for example fiapo and alliance for responsible aquaculture and fish welfare initiative has started you know to gather some information and probably they'll come up with some something uh, in the future which will have a semblance of a guidelines for uh, uh, fish welfare but till now there is nothing you know uh, concrete we have but a silver lining is that you know over the past few years while interacting with farmers i've come to realize that you know indian farmers do accept that fish feels pain and fish also you know should be respected because you know a culture treats teaches us to respect all life forms um but it's usually because of lack of knowledge in them for example you know what people usually think that you know the more the fish the more the water the more the fish so they dig really deep uh, ponds and you know try to have as many fish as possible inside it but it's really bad because you know deep deep ponds doesn't a lot of water doesn't mean um happy fish or you know better growth of the or better um harvest instead you need to have a proper uh, scientific scientifically designed pond with proper depth with proper stocking density with feeding and fertilization that could lead to happy fish and a better growth rate so how do we convince the the farmers uh, with regards to fish welfare actually there has to be confluence between the two yes you need to earn money but we also need to show them the aspect that a fish welfare can actually lead to also lead to better uh, economic output that is what we we should do and for that uh, uh, i am proposing certain critical control points if um, if you know the the aquaculture team of fiapo wants to use it maybe you know i'd be more than happy so these are some of the critical control points uh, in the entire process that you know we need to uh, 
uh, we need to take care of. For example, at brood stock management, um, brood stock man, uh, management, we need to make sure that the brood stock is in proper stocking density. It's given uh, feed that is specific for brood stock. The brood stock is stress free, pollution free. Because you know, if your brood stock is healthy, its offspring will be healthy, and then you have epigenetics. Epigenetics means other fish, it, and the parents have. If they are experiencing their experience is bad, that bad experience can also affect progeny. So, because uh, so yoke ke through epigenetics or genetics, ye sab uh, abhi ham samajh rahe hain zyada zyada. So, aapko brood stock management ko bhi stress free rakhna hai. Hatchery operations. Usually, hatchery operations may welfare issues bahut kam aate hain because you know hatchery operators understand that if their offspring is well taken care of, it will lead to better survival and uh, will lead to better uh, profitability. So, hatchery operations may management is tough, but uh, I found that you know people who, especially in the shrimp farming, um, they they really understand that then they need to. Uh, uh, take care of fish welfare. Uh, then uh, fish seed and juvenile transport. Water temperature का आपको ख्याल रखना है. किस तरह से उसको एक जगह से दूसरी जगह लेके जा रहे हैं. वो ख्याल रखना है. Transportation करने से पहले fish को आपको feeding नहीं देनी है. इसका ख्याल रखना है. और जब मछली आप transport कर रहे हैं, तो आपको ये भी ensure करना है कि जहाँ वो मछली जा रही है, वहाँ पे वो क्या वो जगह प्रिपेयर्ड है क्या वो साइट प्रिपेयर्ड है मछली को रिसीव करने के लिए आ, अगर मान लीजिए आपने मछली को भेज दी पर आगे वो प्रिपेयर्ड नहीं है तो दैट फिश इज गोइंग टू बी अंडर स्ट्रेस एंड इट्स गोइंग टू डाई सो देश दे कुड बी गाइडलाइंस ऑन क्राउडिंग आप कितनी मछली लेके ले जा सकते हैं ट्रांसपोर्टेशन में कितनी मछली आप बैग में डाल सकते हैं या एक ट्रक में जो उसमें पानी भरा हुआ हो उसमें आप कितनी मछली डाल सकते हैं सो so, वो सब गाइडलाइन एक रिसर्च का इशू है जो कि हमको अभी डेवलप करनी है एंड देन Of course, welfare of the grower stage. Subsi important. You have many things. Water temperature, stocking density, shape of the pond, depth of the pond, disease monitoring, and reporting. Reporting is something that is, you know, totally absent these days uh, in India. And it's very important that if your pond has any mistake, you have to import, report it immediately to your um, to the fisheries department so that you know we have we know that what is happening, what kind of diseases are there. फिर न्यूट्रिशन एंड फीडिंग का आपको ख्याल रखना है एंड ऑल दीज थिंग्स डिपेंड ऑन एक्सटेंसिव सेम इंटेंसिव और इंटेंसिव कल्चर दैट मीन्स योर स्टॉक इंटेंसिटी स्टॉक इंटेंसिटी कम है तो आपके वेलफेयर मेंटेन करना इजी होगा इंटेंसिव है जिसमें स्टॉक इंटेंसिटी ज्यादा है तो आपको वेलफेयर के बारे में ज्यादा सोचना होगा ज्यादा मेहनत करनी पड़ेगी तो ये सब चीजें हैं हार्वेस्टिंग uh, कैसे होनी चाहिए स्पीशी स्पेसिफिक रूल्स होने चाहिए आपको स्ट्रेस रिड्यूस करना एंड देन स्टनिंग स्टनिंग इज समथिंग वी डोंट प्रैक्टिस इन इंडिया for very obvious reasons um, that i'm going to discuss in issues farming in india is different from western countries we have to understand that in western countries you know it's completely um, it's well established industry and there's a lot of money in it um, in india shrimp industry kind of resembles that where you know farmers can afford to um, um, invest the money in fish welfare uh, because and and uh, we have seen that you know welfare in the shrimp industry on you know, taking care of uh, welfare of the shrimp in the ponds has eventually led to less diseases and uh, monetary benefits but we can do that in shrimp because shrimp is primarily targeted towards export and you get your investments worth but fin fish farming aisa nahi hai fin fish farming is primarily for domestic consumption domestic consumption may if you increase the regulation it's going to increase the cost of production if you increase the cost of production it's going to affect the affordability of fish fish is going to become expensive and then you know finally you have um, implications on food security so iska kya kar sakte hain iske liye we need to train the farmers unko proper train karna padega we have to sensitize them you have to make them aware of the uh, welfare issues but more importantly we also have to sensitize consumers because if the consumers start demanding that their fish that they eating comes from sustainable sources from the farms that take care of fish welfare automatically farmers will start to do that so we need to, to aware and sensitize uh, consumers as well uh, finally you know uh, i learned with possible research areas uh, specifically with respect to indian context, context. you see fish welfare 
it's not should not be just limited to pharma fiapo and other organizations i know they are working for the welfare of farm fish but there are fish in the wild as well they are suffering more than the fish that suffers in the ponds in the pond you know animal human we we take care of the fish because we know if we don't the fish is going to die but in the wild we are completely ignoring our fish we are treating our water bodies as dumping yards which is you know re- really uh, um, stressful for example you know we have some very good um, resources for example gangetic dolphins and otters which which are you know uh, in a very solid sorry state and we need to do research to understand what kind of contaminants are there uh, i'm trying to get funds for it but um, so far i've not been able to you know i've not i've been unsuccessful uh, but you know that is one one of my dreams and you know, i i want to start up a research project where we could assess the welfare of the fish and aquatic organisms in the wild so this is something we need to do in the future uh, with that uh, i'll end my chat i think i've taken a lot of time and uh, i think uh, we should open the forum for discussion thank you dr ampur that was a very informative uh, session and it was uh, really refreshing to know the thing that you had mentioned that farmers are getting perceptive to the fact that fishes do feel pain and of course there's a need that uh, we need to bridge a gap between like we need to make them more aware so that was refreshing to know um so we'll take questions now um we have a couple of them um so the there are two questions uh, quite similar which say that what are the behavior indicators of fish how do we assess fish behavior so basically what are the ways uh, in some ways in which uh, fishes express their emotions or how do they express their behavior so you see fish welfare if you if you've been absorb, uh, observing fish for a fairly long time you you'd know that you know there is a certain manner at which a fish uh, swims in the in the water it it's quite effortless uh when fish is stress free uh it swims in the water without much effort it doesn't you know it doesn't uh, move in jerky fashion uh it it's you know it's it's very beautiful to see it it's you know it's very pleasing to see a fish you know, swim in the water but on the contrary if it's in stress you you'll realize you know it it's trying to rub itself uh, along the sides of the pond it's gaping for air because you know there you have less oxygen in the water it's um, uh, you you can also judge from the body profile of the fish if the fish is not eating well over the time you'll feel that you see that the fish gets emaciated the head becomes you know much enlarged than the rest of the body it's called you know pinhead shape kind of a fish um the you know the head is you know disproportionately larger than the rest of the fish um one of the most common indicators to answer this question is that you know fish tends to gape uh and uh, you know tend to accumulate at one one particular part of the pond because you know it doesn't like to go somewhere else and and doesn't want to you know uh, be um elsewhere also i've seen that uh, fish like tilapia they tend to be in shoals in groups which is perfectly normal but if there is stress you know you'll find that one or two fish who are that under stress will you know tend to be separate from they'll they tend to be away from the rest of the group because that is an indicator that you know there's something wrong there with that fish it's not being with the other fish so these are some of the subtle indicators of course fish is not going to say tell you or maybe not going to express if this comfort but uh and this, this is the reason why I'll, i always tell people that you know automatic feeders are great you know but we should always be present when the fish are feeding because that is the time when fish come up and they you know show their behavior you, that's the time when you can observe whether the fish has any disease or whether the fish is behaving abnormally whether the fish is eating or not is also an indicator fish usually stops uh, eating if it's under stress so these are some of the behaviors uh, that we can uh, observe um so uh, there's this another question uh, quite important one is that, that um, as fish welfare is now taking momentum 
how do we transform fish welfare knowledge to the fish farmers like how do we convince the policy makers the implementers or how do we approach the rural farmers about fish welfare and uh, to make them understand that fishes are sentient beings so this is a very important question um and biggest problem why most of the guidelines fail is that we are unable to uh, convince the farmers the benefit of those guidelines uh one of the ways is that in india it's still easier because a lot of um, we still you know our culture tells us to respect on farms of life and uh, i was uh, i don't exactly remember that particular reference but in india uh, it was found that 6 out of 10 farmers they they accept you know that fish could can feel pain so that which is a good sign 60% is a good number um but um, if we could somehow convince the farmers and the policy makers that fish welfare is nothing but you know allowing the fish to grow or to to live its life to its fullest you know to its full genetic potential a fish has a genetic potential to grow uh, we know that a fish can grow to this much of size in these many months that's genetic potential and that genetic potential can only be realized when fish is is stress free it's spending less amount of energy in coping with the stress and you know using energy for its growth so if we could convince the farmers and the policy makers that fish welfare will eventually lead to monetary benefits and we have an example from shrimp industry you know in india itself if we could convince people that you know we are not going to impose regulations on you we're not going to impose very harsh regulations on you all we are asking is good management practices we we keep telling our farmers that you know in extensive uh, farming i'll give an example uh, in extensive farming you should not stock more than 4000 to 7000 fish per hectare but for some reason they they believe that you know stocking more fish will eventually lead to more productivity and at the end of the entire production cycle they come back to us and complain about poor fish growth so my point over here is that we have to convince the farmers that proper stocking density uh, uh ideal depth of water uh, water quality parameters yes these are some of the things that ensure fish welfare but at the same time they also ensure that we get the maximum benefit out of our farms and ponds so i think this is the only way we can um, influence our farmers you know because we have to show them the monetary side because you know like as i've already said aquaculture is not charity the people are doing it for money but if you could show them that welfare will eventually lead to better profits uh, i think uh, we will be able to drive our message home um okay um we'll take a final question for the day um are there any trainings on fish welfare in india not that i'm aware of uh, i mean we don't uh, i don't think we we there are any training on fish welfare per se we do a lot of uh, training on uh, aquaculture which um, you know eventually will talk about proper uh, uh, sanitation in the uh, you know in the in the aquaculture around the aquaculture ponds biosecurity uh, good nutrition good feeding and nutrition proper stocking density we do tell those farmers about these but um, if you ask me about you know where we are talking specifically about fish welfare uh, i'm afraid not i don't think so i'm not aware of they could be but i'm not aware of hmm. okay all right i see there is a need of this topic um, mm-hmm. everyone are needs to be Okay um I'd like to thank everyone for joining the session and thank you Dr Ampur it was quite an informative session uh so we reached the end of our session so thank you everyone goodbye happy new year yeah happy new year it was a pleasure bye bye